four helicopters landing under gunfire, coming in, hitting the aircraft, landing at the same time and just taking a split second to look to the left and the right out of the helo and see guys launching out of helos and running towards the gunfire. That's a magic moment. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down the foot and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst the children. children. I could never not go back. They were my friends and they felt the trouble of our assembly. She did say, you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our blokes. Harry Moffat is a former team commander of the Special Air Service Regiment. He passed selection in 1990 and finally left in 2015. 25 years after he initially joined the regiment, when he decided his body, family and future would best be served by moving on. Harry has extensive operational experience, including deployments to Timor and the Middle East. He spoke to me about the psychology of being an elite soldier, leadership in high-tempo deployments, and how best to equip yourself for life after service. I'm in Melbourne today with Harry Moffat. Harry, thanks for coming on Life on the Line. No worries, Alex. Thanks for having me. Where did you grow up, Harry? All over the place. Uh, I was born in Williamstown. I had a few stints here in Melbourne. My father was in the Navy, so we travelled a lot. Sydney, Perth. I think once I estimated that I'd been to maybe 10 schools before I hit year 11 and 12, and that was in uh, finished year 11 and 12 in, um, in Fremantle in Western Australia. I call Melbourne my spiritual home so it's nice to be back after 40 years I think yeah so I kind of I think the nomadic life growing up has its negatives and its positives but uh, mostly positive I think yeah tell me a bit about your father's service Uh, so he's Navy 25 years maybe more actually and he was a marine technician hull as I were called which is just a fancy way of saying carpenter for the ship which sounds kind of counterintuitive, but uh, he did a lot of work, spent a lot of time on the ships and um, was in maintenance. And he rose to the rank of uh, equivalent of warrant officer in the army. They had to have a warrant officer as well. And he finished his time actually, which interestingly on the Melbourne aircraft. And I remember flying across from Perth where we were based at that time, it was around 1980 maybe, flew across to Sydney for the decommissioning of the Melbourne, which was the last aircraft carrier the Australian. Defence Force had, and uh, seeing all these grown men, bearded men crying on the on the docks at Garden Island in Sydney was kind of really stuck with me. But I guess that goes to show how how connected they became to the ship, and I suppose an insight into what service life is like too, how encompassing it is, and how deeply it gets into your psyche, I suppose. So that was him, and then he also he went on to work in mining and oil in West Australia for for a period, and he's retired down the south of WA now. Someone said to me the other day, in a business context, how many businesses have 50-year reunions? And it got me thinking, my father still goes to reunions for his class, for ships, for every year. That's what he kind of essentially does now. And uh, I guess that, again, uh, separates the civilian world and the, the military world, perhaps, or some parts of the business world. So I've just started doing that, going to review uh, reunions, 25-year <laughs> reunions and whatnot makes you feel a bit old. But uh, again, I guess it's indicative of service generally and how it uh, it kind of just is all encompassing. Do you have any other military history in the family? My grandfather served in the English army and my father's uh, recently collected all the history on that and and written on that. I haven't seen that yet. But yes, my father's brothers both served in the RAF and the army. That's pretty much it, I think, Vietnam era mostly. And as I said, our family's kind of a bit splintered in historically on my father's side. So he's just kind of piecing that all together. In your childhood, what were your major interests and hobbies? Were you outdoorsy? Were you more academically inclined? Probably, yeah, sports. An easy way to make new friends and all the different cities you're moving around to. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And I think just naturally, I had a penchant for sport and uh, enjoyed football and cricket. 
I wasn't that academically inclined, although later in life I've become more so in studying. But yeah, sports, I was a very bit of a class clown and a bit of a disruptor. It's a good thing these days, apparently. Do you recall when you first had an interest, even a vague one, in the military? Open days with my father, probably stand out at uh, whichever barracks he was serving at, whether it was down at Cerberus or in Sydney at Garden Island, they'd have open days. So I was always exposed to it and immersed in it. I was always with dad at a senior NCO's mess or something like that. So always around it. I don't really remember not being around it. I guess when it came to me, it wasn't until about 12 or 13 when I saw the SAS, 22 SAS, the UK SAS, on television and on the front pages conducting the um, Princess Gate Iranian Embassy hostage rescue, if you remember, I think it was about 1980 or so. That was probably the first time when I saw those black cladded guys, you know, hooded guys hanging off the side of the building. I wondered... That really cool classic black and white shot of them ready to sweep in. And- yeah, absolutely. And uh, the bombs, I thought that's what... I don't know what they're doing, but that's awesome. And I want to yeah, explore that more. Or, or actually, I, you know, I, I thought I want to do that. That's something uh, that was kind of the first time I thought that's what I could do with my life. And I felt, I suppose, encouraged by the fact that I had a, a connection to the military through my father. So it gives you a bit of confidence, I guess, and a role model to follow. You're not the first SAS person I've spoken with who saw that photo and went, yeah, that looks cool. Yeah. <laughs> sign me up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When did you first sign the dotted line? Uh, so 1986, uh, finished year 12, made the cut for uni, which, I, which was a big decision. I wanted to go in and do psychology at, at uni. I think clearly the pull from, from the military was greater and uh, signed up in yeah, 1986 in Perth, finished Kapuka, the normal kind of entry enlistment. At the end of Kapuka, in those days, they just would assign you to a corps from there based on the testing and how you performed. And I found myself in Signals Corps and I wanted to go to infantry. That was my kind of main, that was the route to SAS in those days, less so now. They sent me off to Signals Corps and training in Melbourne. So my first year was kind of a little bit bittersweet because I felt like I was at that time going to a non-infantry unit. I was missing the boat, but I was encouraged through my training that that wasn't the case. And I was able to apply for SAS from anywhere across the, the military. I was happy with that. So how long were you a SIG before applying for selection? Uh, four years I was posted to Townsville. I did some work. I was good at Morse code, unfortunately, and tinkered with some languages as well. Apparently, I was, I was okay with that again, unfortunately, because it, it's, it wasn't what I wanted to do. I was kind of sitting in classrooms learning languages and Morse. But anyway, I ended up at Townsville. Had a bit to do with the infantry battalions there as, as a SIG attached to companies and whatnot, which was great. Uh, so it got me closer. And in 1989 is when I decided to apply, but way too young in retrospect, because I was quite immature then, I still am. But in 1990, I went across to Perth and was lucky enough to pass selection. I think we started with about 150 people and finished with 18 or 19 guys. So yeah, privileged, honoured, and still feel like an imposter today. Jumping back to when you were in the regular army, was there anything of significance or notability during that time you want to share? Or I loved being out bush. I suppose that was that's kind of my. I love going on exercises. I, yeah, I love being out in the in the weeds and like being in in the jungle. I used to volunteer for all the, the Tully trips. I suppose that that was the big thing. I, I'd grown up pretty much in the city and my father was a bushy and a hard worker, and I used to help him at home. And getting my hands dirty was great. Felt good and, and honest. I hear if you're going to do that, Tully is the place to do that. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, you got to sleep with rats and inches and feet of rain and good character building stuff. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but I had a sense that it was improving me, that it was making me a better person. It felt like I was accomplishing something, I guess. And also learning a lot about, a lot of people would think soldiering is pretty basic and in, in its rawest form, it certainly is. However, when you start diving into the theory of jungle warfare, machine gun theory, those type, they're very highly technical. You know, there's volumes of academic literature on this stuff. And I found, I, I just loved the technical trade, if you like, and learning that. And I thought I achieved a pretty decent level as a young guy in the jungle and as a warfighter or training as a warfighter. So it was highly attractive to me. You know, I was a 17, 18, so it was a formative time, camaraderie and women, beer and cars and, and those types of things. It, it was a really enjoyable time in Townsville. Many mates I've still got, I still keep in touch with. 
good fun, hard work. I wouldn't say there was any kind of anything in that period that really sticks out as a single event or, or anything. You mentioned the statistic of the number of guys you walk into SAS selection with and then the number who pass. Obviously, Special Force selection process is famous or infamous for how challenging and hard it is and the psychological rigors you go through and how you're tested to the extreme physically to test the psychology. The road to SAS has changed over the years and I want to come back to later that path today for anyone listening who might be interested, but let's talk about your experiences getting through selection. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, talk about formative moments in one's life. I guess that started in 1988, 89, realising that I could do it. I'd heard about an interview, a friend of mine who had passed and was serving in the SAS and that definitely encouraged me and gave me the confidence to, to attempt it. So the way it works, and it still works like this today, the roadshow comes around from uh, SAS with the recruitment drive, the presentations and the, um, the SAS guys that give those. And basically you just sign the line, give your name and they follow you up. So once I'd committed to it, I spent the next 12 to 18 months just training as hard as I could, which was in the gym, cardio, in the mountains by myself with a pack on my back, compass in hand, map to ground. And I had a bit of guidance from a a major who was serving with the regiment at that time. Uh, He was a SIG major and he he mentored me through the training process and what I should be doing. So... And I really enjoyed that. I spent a lot of time up at Rolly Stone outside of Perth in the hills by myself, navigating and sleeping out. And again, just really enjoyed that lifestyle, I suppose. You need to adopt it. But it's one thing to be told uh, you need to undergo this kind of incredible training regimen to make it there. It's another thing to actually resolve and do it mentally to yeah. push yourself to that limit. Yeah, definitely. And one thing, uh, particularly through study and my ongoing involvement with the regiment, you know, motivation eats all other aspects of life, intelligence, fitness, looks. <laughs> one thing I would say that sticks out, one quality that sticks out of all of the individuals, not just in the essays, there's a lot of accomplished and successful people across many domains, is their, that kind of internal drive almost an internal competitiveness. And if you want to go to the dualism of man, one side's highly competitive with the other side driving each other on it. So that's another discussion. But I think that that's the thing that really sticks out and it's no surprise. um, But it's uh, not only just motivated to accomplish things, but actually attracted to the, the challenge, the intrinsic kind of challenge. It feels good. It feels like you're accomplishing something while you're doing hard yards. You know, it's, uh, so it's a strange, a strange thing. So I spent, a, a yeah, like I said, uh, 12 to 18 months training. I was a small, skinny guy. I, had, I felt I had to put on weight, which I, I did, and rolled up to selection in, in uh, March 1990. Yeah, felt on the back foot from the out. There's a lot of big men there, older than me, and the regiment's full of, you know, average age is quite a bit older than most units. A lot of infantry and combat arms guys there, a lot of, uh, quite a few commandos, so people who'd come through from the commando units. So I felt out of my depth, and back in those days, bullying wasn't a dirty word. So there's lots of sledging, and lots of sigs were called chooks, and um, so there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And selection, yeah, I mean, I, I can remember just about everything about it. I could talk to it for an hour. I think uh, what I would say as an overview is that it's a crucible moment in life, unlike many others. And that 24 day period, I think it was, transformed me from an immature young punk to what I th- hope I was a mature young man. The class that I went through with, given a few couple of minutes, I could name them all and we stay in touch. We lost a few guys in the Black Hawk accident in, in the mid 90s, but um, it wasn't as hard as I thought it'd be. But I think it was because I was given into it so much that I didn't even worry, I didn't think about it being hard. I just thought about it being it and I'll just get through it. And if I get to the end, that's going to you know, increase my chances of passing. You focused on the significance of it rather than, oh, this is the difficulty itself. Mm. Talk me through maybe one or two specific anecdotes of exercises or tasks you were given just as an example of the rigors you were put through. It's all designed to, to test you in the first instance physically to break you down. So there's a, in the initial stages, and it's still quite similar today, in the initial stages, lots of physical activity, lots of navigation, 
solo navigation and team navigation. The whole time you're being assessed, the whole time, this is one of the great uh, strengths of the course is it's a high instructor ratio to student and high turnover instructors through the CADA as well. So you never have the same people testing or, or sorry, assessing you kind of in any given half day period. I guess uh, in terms of anecdotes, the things I do remember were the Stirling Rangers. We have the um, Happy Wanderer, it's called Exercise. It's four days, four nights and five days um, in the Stirling Rangers, navigating by yourself. I think you can do around 80 or 90 kilometres in the five days in the mountains at, at, at Stirling Rangers. And I remember reaching that part. I completed that in time and around average, met all my marks quite easily but I remember enjoying again enjoying the time the alone time because up until that phase you were just being smashed as groups and physically mentally waking up at three in the morning to do Russian astronaut tests that you didn't understand but it was just there to muck with your mind one thing that does stand out was my birthday was held on the 23rd of March during the early phases when we were all one big collective group there's about 90 people left and um they made me stand up while everyone else did push-ups. They made me stand up with a, a cake with a few matches in it, you know, lit and sing happy birthday to myself. And uh, they were doing push-ups and the instructor said, um, that wasn't good enough. We want you to sing with more gusto. And so that was pretty embarrassing. And I think- That's a unique uh, selection process. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's, they just like to mark with your mind, I guess. It was quite unremarkable in the selection in mean in detail because I just uh, tried to be the grey man in all of the runs, all of the physical activities that we completed, the, whether it was a navigation or the team exercises. I never wanted to be first and never wanted to be last. I just wanted to kind of be in the mix. There's a saying, kind of be the grey man on the selection course, you know, don't stand out and be there at the end. It's kind of the, the, the message. The Australian Defence Force is coming out of the long peace period, essentially. We've got some humanitarian aid and peacekeeping deployments coming up on the horizon, but we've not had many active overseas work since Vietnam. Are you looking at the global situation, wondering what am I gonna to get to do? What am I gonna to get to deploy as? Or are you just young and excited to be putting on the SAS uniform? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. I was talking about this with the CO yesterday. Personally, I get this uh, waiting to play at the game for real. I, I, and uh, a lot of guys still do feel like that, the guys coming through into the unit. I wasn't at the time we had, it was what it was, we were on standby, but we also had the new beast that was counter-terrorism. SAS took that over in the mid eighties, I think. And we were in training on an annual basis, traveling around Australia, training with local police and, and the police tactical groups at that stage. So it was a real adventure for me. I was just happy to be in the unit. It was tough. I was struggling. I struggled for the first few years just because I was young, immature. You know, one morning we had Fight Club one morning. You can't talk about Fight Club. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, yeah, yeah, the re reference to the movie, but it's, yeah, it's nothing like that. I hope not. <laughs> I'm sure there were p real people there. Can you explain Fight Club? Uh, Fight Club's just uh, with our name for uh, CQF, Close Quarter Fighting, and we practice everything from, you know, a blend of MMA to boxing to, you know, a whole bunch of different styles. Whoever's running the show for that period kind of gets to influence it. But really it's about just building confidence and, and uh, an ability to last 30 seconds to a minute in a fight because you'll back your cardio against your opponents every time. And then once they start to tire in that environment. Lasting, yeah, minutes in close quarter combat is exhausting and it's a lot harder than it sounds. That's for right. One minute, two minutes, three minutes. That's right. In a lot of instances, we will come from a perspective of just lasting that first 30 seconds minute. And so for me, a guy who's at best 80 to 85 kilos at this stage, against a guy who weighs you know $1. twenty or something, you're going to be struggling. So it's just about kind of getting to a point where they start to fatigue. But uh, anyway, so Fight Club, I remember the first morning, it actually wasn't the first morning, but it was one of the first times I'd gone to Fight Club. A guy walked out, he would have been more than 100 kilos. He would have been maybe mid-30s, half-shaven, looked like a bloody busted ass, you know, head like a busted ass. And uh, he just walked up to me and knocked me out, essentially. And when I came to, I had a tooth in my, loose in my mouth and he basically just said, you know, this is a serious place, mate, you know, you know no, no uncertain words, and you need to toughen up, you know, princess. And uh, that was a defining moment for me to realise that I'm here and it's tough. In my own mind, I used to think it was like a prison yard I got to go home from sometimes. But it needs to be, it needs to have elements of that because the job that's asked to be done ultimately is pretty pretty serious. 
that early stage for me, I was just happy to be there. And I was probably surviving more than thriving at that time and learn a lot and learn fast. And up until, uh, you, you mentioned about Vietnam, I guess up until Somalia, there was just kind of bits and bobs here and there. And the SAS had some roles, whether it be interagency or whether it be through defence's advisory roles. But it was probably Somalia was the first time that the deployment. Were you on that trip? I wasn't, but my troop or our troop was. K troop and they sent the contingent and I didn't feel you know that I missed out or anything the senior guys were chosen they chose a, a small group of individuals to go to Somalia that went on for quite a period we were the first ones to go in and then the military followed and etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think yeah it's well known now you mentioned losing guys at the Black Hawk incident can you talk a bit more on that the Black Hawk accident was a tragic accident in Townsville high range training area in uh, I think it was 94 I've got that right and I think 15 guys at regiment guys were killed and three aviators were killed and again I hope I got those numbers correct I personally knew all of those all the guys from the regiment on there and and the pilots as well we had an annual exercise up there to do uh, CT counterterrorism training. Up until that point, it was uh, very realistic. It involved multiple aircraft flying in close proximity, low to the ground at night, doing choreographed move maneuvers, etc., at great speed, and also live firing out of those helicopters onto the ground and targets onto the ground individuals roping vehicles on the ground. So really, really complex type of thing. So we used to, and in retrospect, maybe too much so, used to drive pretty hard to make it as real as we could in a hostage rescue or or an intervention kind of a situation. You want to be, you know, speeds of the essence. And unfortunately on that night, two helicopters collided, two Black Hawk helicopters collided and on board were a couple of dozen individuals, most of which who were killed in the in the accident. So, and we had another dozen or so on the ground who ran to try and aid them, but um, not much could be done to to burning helicopters. We lost a hundred years of of experience in in one hit, and for a small unit, we we're barely in the hundreds of individuals. You know, it was a, a big loss, and I've always thought that it took another half a decade to get over that, maybe longer, to catch up with the experience. So. Talk me through the next few years of your career from those early days of Fight Club and just learning the ropes. We were almost on a permanent counterterrorism role or cycle from counterterrorism to jungle back to counterterrorism. So that was it until around 95, 96. And I was feeling very burnt out at that stage and took some years off, travelled to England where I worked with the police there for a period, not as a policeman, but uh, in, the, in a training capacity. And my wife as a teacher. Actually, that was a really good move in, in hindsight. And then I came back in, in uh, the late 90s, 2000, and then... 2001 kicked off and, and when I got back in I had to do a couple of couple of courses to get back up to speed new weapons etc and so the regiment said yeah sure dive back in yeah definitely yeah I was uh, I thought a good performer in the first number of years and it's actually a way we still use more and more we support guys to take a break occasionally to spend time with their families it's actually a really I think something we can used to our advantage and, and with the new millennials coming through they'll probably want to have you know four five year careers or whatever as opposed to one big 20 year career i think it's something we need to look look at more broadly so yeah to come back in 2000 again probably off the back of the black hawk accident it was uh, a bit of gap in experience maybe but there was a few guys got back in around that time and particularly after 2001 actually that was the year that i came back september 11 kind of changed everything dramatically for all of us for humanity <laughs> but particularly for us that that really changed everything and uh, we had quite a few guys come back to swell the ranks were you back with the regiment by that point yeah i was, I was actually just in the midst of coming back i was like i said training with the coppers in the uk and had a phone call from uh, at the rsm at that stage gary kingston and i'd reached out to another mate of mine as well but it was right around that time and then uh, I remember, I think I was doing some bag work with some police in, in the UK when September 11 happened. I kind of just knew this is going to be... This is going to impact me. Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. How long is it from you rejoining the regiment to your first overseas deployment? Yeah, months. So I came back, we did some upskill work on the patrol course and some other courses and literally got dragged off those courses to go and into a troop and we were the first 
actually we're the second squadron into Bagram in um, 2002, one, two, that the Christmas or might have been January 2002, we, we took over from, I think it was two squadron that stage. Yes, and that, that was the first real deployment I'd been on in 2002 and then it just, I went into a revolving door of deployments which didn't stop until 2013. We got uh, 11 deployments over that decade and a bit from 2002. Can you talk me through some highlights, some highs and lows, and the journey you went on as a person through all those operational deployments? Certainly the, the biggest highlight, if you like to call it, or the, or the biggest impact, most positive experience or overwhelmingly positive experience is working with the people that you, you get to work with. It's a high performing organization, high reliability organization, and, and some of the individuals that you work with, so without sounding too melodramatic, you know, exceptional human beings, highly intelligent, physically prepared, really at the top of their game. So I've been lucky enough to have uh, team leaders who have influenced me, almost kind of surrogate fathers in a way, and they've prepared me mentally and for a lot of the rigors. And it's great when you are scared, because you do get scared there's uh, fears are ever present for most people some people don't you suppose you worry about them but uh having those kind of individuals around leading you when you're a young man is um super powerful and i had so much respect so that's probably the the everlasting memory i would take away from the whole experience i mean there's plenty of highs and plenty of lows probably the highlight of my career if there was if i was to pick one is leading missions parachute missions in Afghanistan, night jumps into the mountains to interdict targets. And so, you know, leading 30 or 20 SAS guys off the back of a ramp out into the mountains of Afghanistan to conduct a mission, probably a highlight for me, one of many. And then there's low lights. And I think everyone would agree that the low lights are seeing your mates get hurt. I was unfortunately driving the car in which um, Short McCarthy was killed in uh, 2008, which is probably the low point for me. I still reflect on that. Uh, he's a wonderful human being again and um, very good friend. There's many of those. We've had lots of guys hurt and, and lots of guys killed across the time, but no one ever steers away from that. That's a fact of life. There's no kind of regret in any of that. And there's some reservations around what, you know, the relevance of deployments and, and why we're there. For example, you, know, you may be right to question out whether our, our presence in Iraq, for example, for as long as we were there. The initial deployment, we absolutely should have been there. Australian long-range vehicle patrols in the Western Desert, we were the force of choice, I think. But all that political stuff aside, you go because you want to protect vulnerable people who can't defend themselves against extreme bullying, you know, I mean, really extreme. And um, you also want to go because your mates are there as well. So there's that, that kind of aspect. And also you'd like to go along and test yourself as well. That's that, There's that adventurous type of part, which I don't want to make light of how serious the job is, but there is an adventurous kind of element to it all. You're fulfilling a sort of boyhood dream of playing soldier on the big stage. That is a small part of what you're doing underneath. I found myself conflicted by that at times because... It kind of it sounds a bit trite to kind of say I'm fulfilling a boyhood dream when the job's really tragic. The consequences of sending in a troop of any kind of SF unit, they're not going there to kind of knock on doors and negotiate. If you're sending kind of units to do into those environments, it's going to be kinetic, as we'd say. You know, it's going to be the reality is grittier. Yeah. I was always a bit conflicted you know, between wanting to do it, this kind of, you know, as you say, kind of childhood dream or prepubescent type of dream. But uh, the job kind of needs, I think it deserves a bit more serious analysis than that. And at times I think we're under trained at how to deal with that, you know, reconciling the political need or intent of what we're doing. You know, it's more, there can be a bit of, this is what we're doing, get on and do it. Um, where I think there should be a bit more philosophical kind of discussions around that. And I'm not saying that that would make soldiers question why or what they're doing, but it might help a bit more in reconciling it in their own minds after they've uh, been involved in, in some of these kind of tragic and traumatic experiences. Having said that, I think selection sets us up really well. We need to pick people who can be in combat during the day or night and then come home and go to bed and sleep 
soundly. You know, we need a bit of narcissism in people so that uh, when they're standing on the edge of the ramp at 30,000 feet at night, about to jump out with a range of people, potentially with someone strapped to their chest, that they are that confident that they're going to get it done. Yeah, we do select the right people. But again, I think uh, it wouldn't hurt to have those discussions around the more philosophical elements. We've talked about so far the psychology of the soldier, right from the selection process to the different emotions you're wrestling with when you're overseas in the field. At various points in your deployments, you're a team leader. In that role, you don't just have to worry about your own mental outlook, your own psychological needs, but those of the guys under you. Mm. How do you wrestle with that? Yeah, another great question. So you're a, you're a father, you're a team leader, expert, you're a padre, you're a financial advisor, you're a marriage counsellor. In fact, overseas, probably the largest portion of effort that you might have in uh, in the team or your effort in administering the team or managing the team is managing issues back home with marriages, finances, etc. Young guys coming through, they just get so excited or not excited, they get so involved in the unit and the unit set was such at a high pace during that time. Things like finances and marriages and that kind of take us a back seat. And uh, as you can well imagine, that's not a, not a good thing. So as a team leader, managing the teams that's uh, you really need to wear all of those hats and we try to train our junior leaders or the lead they're not junior they're quite senior soldiers by the time they reach this level but try and emphasize that that's an important aspect in the field absolutely as a team leader you probably you know, haven't been looking after yourself that well so you probably haven't eaten or slept as well as you should have leading up to that so when you're out in the field you again need to be conscious of that and making decisions and where you're placing people asking individuals to do jobs to hold places that you know are potentially put them in in harm's way is uh, always fraught. But I guess we, you know, we train so much together, particularly in a team context. We rely on each other so much that uh, there's a lot of the decisions in a smooth running SAS team. It's like a like a ballet, real almost. It's you know everybody knows where to go, what to do. Really, in many cases, an operator is already doing what you are anticipating he'll need to do. In fact, in the best teams, leading is easy. You don't uh, need to do a whole lot. You just need to make sure that the communications are, are occurring and the coordination and allowing guys to do their job. That's a unique aspect, again, as opposed to many other military or even any other domains of life where people have a very much a directive type of or, or autocratic almost kind of approach to, to leadership. You talk about marriage counselling, but were you having to do wider counselling in a way in things like first contacts or losing mates? Are you having soldiers come up and talk to you about these experiences or are they bottling it up, focusing on the job? I think to a degree you need to bottle it up in the first instance. I can hear a million psychologists screaming out and saying, oh, no, you need to open up. I think inside the patrol or the team, you... In theatre. In theatre, you deal with that within the troop and if there is any kind of adverse reaction. But again, we pick pretty resilient people. And again, I, I talked about reconciling your, your emotions and your thoughts. I think we do that reasonably well. Your question probably goes more to later on down the track after deployments... And it's a tricky area because psychologists still have stigma attached to them. Being seen to be going to the psychologist has a certain, as I said, certain stigma. So now my role is broader than it ever was post kind of all these events. I regularly now get contacted by guys saying, oh, I want to have a chat about this. But at the time, particularly over that decade, there was a bit of you know, kind of bottling it up and uh, moving on. The military likes to say that it does mental health pretty well. Uh, I think it doesn't. I think there's a lot of people who hold on to it. A lot of experts would hold on to the kind of ownership of, of mental health and how we're supposed to do it properly. I've got my own ideas, but I think that uh, we everybody was just so busy in during that time that um, there's probably a few people who got through the the net and um, probably needed should have had more intensive counselling at that at that time. We've also talked about motivation and how that feeds everything in life and that applies to pre-selection training and of course it applies to maintaining yourself as an elite operator pushing yourself through these very difficult circumstances and you've also touched on the politics of the situation that are we always meant to be here are we making a difference and as you say especially in afghanistan you're over there and you are seeing that you are helping people you are protecting them against the taliban you are trying to make their region more stable and more peaceful 
as you get later into your career and Afghanistan drags on, becomes Australia's longest war, does that resolve and positivity that we're here making a difference, does that start to weaken? It was talked about for a while. We had a good sense of history. So we knew the Russians attempts and the American, you know, the kind of proxy war that occurred with the Mujahideen in the you know, 70s and 80s, I think it was. And we knew that the British had been there 200 years before and others had tried to conquer the, the area and that it probably wouldn't be, you know, we weren't going to have victory, so to speak. I remember speaking to a CIA guy named John one time. I think we were having a cigarette out on a on, a, on an overwatch position somewhere in the mountains up, up the north. I said to him, do you know where they all are? How are we going to win this war? And he just said, we'll never win this war. He said, it's it's unwinnable. And uh, he said, not unless we took the gloves off. And uh, I didn't kind of pursue it any further, but my feeling was that it was like, you know, unless we drop a nuclear bomb on the, <laughs> on the place, that was uh, my sense that it was kind of that forlorn that uh, it, inevitably it would it would be lost. So I don't think that was ever lost on us that we were going to have or we ever thought we were going to have ultimate victory. In asymmetric warfare these days, it's, there is no kind of victory. It's just small bat- winning small battles. However, there is a sense of doing the right thing. While you're there in Tarrant Count, although we operated more broadly, there's some nasty people, some bad people that need to be brought to account. And we took a certain amount of pride in bringing those people to account, whichever way was appropriate at the time. Where it kind of all comes together for me, and I, 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 can, I know I speak for other guys as well, some other guys, when you see the impacts of people having safe environments, so you see girls going back to school, you see hospitals being erected, um, you see people out in the villages with water and blankets and food that they've had stolen from them by a foreign enemy to them as well. You know, a lot of these people are coming from outside of Afghanistan or outside of Iraq or wherever, and uh, would be no different in Syria as well as foreign fighters. When you see those kind of the consequences of your action or the downstream effects, that, that's really satisfying. Humanitarian aid, and, you know, some of the work we did in Timor, there was direct impacts. And in a lot of ways, that was some of my most satisfying deployment time because we had direct impacts in safety and providing people with shelter who were in, in harm's way. So, yeah, that's, that's what I'd say about that. I think that you don't probably don't go over there thinking, well, I'm going to save vulnerable people, or, but it certainly becomes apparent that that's one of the main things it's about. There was a great image there near the start of that answer about you having a cigarette with your mate in Overwatch position. And I can imagine those kind of memories actually stand out the most, not swooping in and through a village or across an open plain exchanging gunfire or just watching through binoculars or a sniper scope, but just those calm before the storm mm. moments and shooting the breeze. Yeah, you're dead right. So, you know, there's, there's I, I talked about the balletic, or if that's such a word, how watching an SAS team in action or, or taking a moment go to four helicopters landing in the dash under gunfire coming in, hitting the aircraft, landing at the same time and just taking a split second to look to the left and the right out of the helo and see guys launching out of helos and running towards the gunfire and being part of that, that's a magic moment. Or being in in six LRPVs, long range patrol vehicles, streaming across the desert towards contact, they definitely stand out. But you're dead right, it's the more peaceful time. I actually think that the things that stick with me are the humorous times, you know, the kind of banal everyday things, you know, things like taking a dump on a 60-day patrol and you've been in contact and someone having to crawl off or in a potential minefield or people having to crawl around the car and, and you know, the different kind of positions you have to take, you know, those types of things really, uh, they're the things we laugh and talk about. There's so many, mate. I I, um, I was lucky enough to spend some time up in the hills with Alfredo Renato, the militia leader in Timor. He was probably what part of the quartet of main players. He had Ramos Horder and Janana Guzmao and Marty Alcatiri, and he was probably the fourth of that group at, that we were helping and assisting and keeping an eye on to a large degree. And um, I had one of those moments with Alfredo. We were up in his mountain hideaway and one of the first nights we were up there we were having a glass of wine we'd had some dinner and having a glass of wine and again a cigarette out on the balcony and and he said uh you've you've come to kill me haven't you harry and i said no mate we're just here to keep an eye on you over the the period of the elections and keep him out of the streets because he'd been a bit of a troublemaker i think he and i probably slept with a gun under our pillow for the first uh few nights I found him to be a charming, lovely guy. He was, he'd done some bad things, but I think he honestly believed in the country. But uh, I think he 
drank a bit too much in the end and became kind of paranoid and the rest is kind of history for him. So they, they, they are special moments, the, the, the kind of calm before the storm, if you put it like that. But um, it's punctuated equilibrium in a lot of ways, soldiering full stop, you know, anything in, in the Defence Force. It's kind of this call to action at periods and then there's a lot of downtime in between. And we, we feel that our unit or the unit fills that with training and keeping sharp. And as a quick clarification, when were you also sent to Timor? Uh, so I had a couple of stints there in 06 and 08. You were being marriage counsellor to some of the guys in your unit. What about your own experiences? How did all this constant deploying overseas and this high stress, singular focus environment affect relationships and family back home for you? The single greatest sacrifice I've made in my ongoing time is my family. Thank God I'm still married to a great woman, a stoic professional woman who's stuck by me and I've given her no great cause to want to leave other than spent more than half of our marriage separated overseas or whatever. And my children as well. I've got two young adult children. My son is probably the most lamentable part of my service is the loss of time I spent with my son. I think I was around for about three of his birthdays until the age of 10 or 12. On occasion when we're having a blow up, he'll, uh, he'll remind me of that. So there's no doubt about that. I have deep regrets about that. So I, I think it's, I'm happy to be here, body and mind mostly intact, quite beaten and weathered, but I think my, my family suffered significantly from it. Therefore, I've got a lot of lot of messages for guys coming to the unit about you know what they need to do, not what they need to do, the lessons that I've learned and the mistakes that I've made and how important it is not to just kind of throw away lines, spend time with your family and children. But it's a difficult task. You know, we ask a lot of our soldiers full stop, but I think particularly in our unit, even when we're back, we're away. We're training, we're supporting regional training. So you can spend only four months away on operations during a year. You can spend another four months away. And then the army asks, on top of that, the army asks us to do army courses, which have questionable relevance in a lot of instances to our core job. But so there's this always someone asking you. And then when there's a big army exercise on, they're asking for help. So, you know, I think in, an, in one 18 month period, sorry, in one 24 month period, I spent 18 months away, like away, away. It gets to the point where I like to say that um, being away is like being at home and being at home is like being away. And my wife reached a point in some stages where she said having your home was more of a disruption than a, than a nicety. You know. Your final deployment to Afghanistan was in 2012. Talk me through the journey from after that deployment to what you're doing today and the transition that went with that. Yes, yeah, so I came back from Afghanistan 2012. I made a decision, a deliberate decision to kind of call it quits there. So I, I'd been, I still am a sergeant, will stay that that way for as long as I possibly can. I'd been a team leader for the best part of seven years at that stage, six or seven years, which is a very good run. And that's the, the time that most guys crave. But you do need to move on. Some individuals hang around too long and you can because it was such high tempo they were always looking. And I thought I was, I felt like I was kind of at the top of my game and I could do it on my terms. I took a position as the high performance manager at the unit in one of our cells. We set about redesigning the, the high performance program and that continues today, which is great. And the new barracks has been built and we've got a new gym and a new, a new approach to cognitive mental skills training through to how we train guys physically and uh, how we look after our families. Uh, so I spent two years there and then I had finished my degree in psychology, my bachelor, and started a master's program. Um, I was doing clinical psych and it all got a bit heavy on me, to be honest, because uh, we have a peer support program in the unit of sorts where we train guys to help guys who are struggling. And I'd been doing a bit of that and it's pretty heavy stuff. So I transferred then from the master's in clinical psych across to org psych. And one of the better programs is here in Melbourne. And that was kind of catalyst for me to ask my wife, would you move to Melbourne and get out of the unit because, you know, get off the hamster wheel. Back to your spiritual home as well. Back to my spiritual home, watch a bit of footy and um, finish my master's. And that was my get out of the army because I want to have another career and I'd like to go into some kind of consultancy, performance type consultancy. I'm well known in the unit for my almost religious fervour around getting guys educated. It was a dirty word for so long. You know, if you were educating, ah, what do you need to be educated? Bloody soft rubbish, you know. But uh, more and more guys uh, realise the value. And, and a lot of guys were studying, just not 
out in the open, if it makes sense. It sounds kind of strange, doesn't it? But it was. It was kind of a, a closet scholars we had. Uh... There's a bit of old school mentality there towards academic pursuit. But from speaking with some more recent guys who are out of special forces, they're going on doing, you know, business degrees and things like that because that is future proofing their income for their families and they just want a new challenge, something new to occupy themselves with. Definitely. And we squander to a large degree in the regiment, we squander that intellect or that aptitude or that motivation. Well, you said motivation feeds all aspects of life. And like you said, it's not just the physicality or the mental resilience, it is intelligence too. Spot on. And you're dead right, that kind of academic pursuit. I wish we were a bit better at doing that earlier in people's careers because I think we'd get better results in terms of strategic thinking, critical thinking, planning. We've got some super intelligent, super crafty, almost Machiavellian type of minds. Um, And I think the education kind of brings a bit of polish to that and brings a bit of structure and thinking, and that's not lost on you and I, Alex. But I think more importantly these days, that the iron bubble in which the SAS lives, you know, this shroud of secrecy, and and that should should be the case. That needs to be maintained from a global perspective. However, I think we should be pulling back the curtain occasionally to let a bit of light in. And I think one of the ways we can do that is to support individuals to go out into the academic realm, into into universities who offer kind of a host to do that safely in. Most of the individuals I speak to are going out and study and particularly under our scholarship program. What they tell me is it's not so much the education and learning, et cetera. It's just being immersed in a room full of peers but from the civilian world that are really smart and have lives. And um, and I think that exposure is what builds the resilience and the confidence for guys to then go on post-service. And I think that's part of it. If you feel it's the same with sports people, I know it's the same with uh, many other spheres of life, that loss of identity when you do choose to leave an institution or leave a former life, that's the hard thing. And I, and I think exposure to other areas is the key How did you find the emotional journey from slowing down from that fast-paced life to a relatively much slower paced life? It's still going. I'm still coming to terms with it. I I just came back from San Diego and I spent some time with a couple of mates from the SEALs, a friend of mine, Coleman, who's seven years post Navy SEALs now. He was a team commander. He'd been in the unit for a long time there. And we were chatting about that. And he said that he thinks it takes about 10 years that's his best. And he's he's looked a lot at this and helped a lot of guys through their transition. He runs his own consultancy. So he's, he's established, you know, he's made the journey. He feels he's like he's only just starting to come to terms with it. And I like that. I'm just about to start that journey. I'm 50 years old, so it's late in uh, in my career and trying to reinvent yourself is difficult, particularly at, in universities surrounded by 20-somethings who... Uh, kind Look of, at the mature age student and go... Mm. Yeah, they're, well, they're just dumb. They're old, dumb, you know. So it is difficult and I, I really enjoyed that conversation because it made me realise I shouldn't be any, in any rush and there's lots of things that I've got that I can take with me. But I think it's a lot like a selection course. It's kind of the, the selection course at the end of your service. You've just got to get on and get it done. And there's a lot of suck it up about it, but you've got to bring the same kind of resilience and motivation to that transition as you did to your entry into the unit. To come down from this, there is a level of anxiety that you're left with because particularly from the deployments and the expectations of the unit kind of raise the bar significantly and you're at this kind of heightened machine-like pace in your life, you know, that you, when it stops, you're kind of left there and now you've got to find a way to kind of bring the normal back down to the new normal. That leaves you with some anxieties and some vulnerabilities. My mind is now that you've got to bring the same kind of resolve to come down. That means engaging with psychologists, so speaking with people about how you're feeling, et cetera, re-embracing your family, finding a new way to establish potentially relationships with kids and and wives that might have been stretched or strained over the time, a new way of training. So you don't need to train every day. You don't need to bust your body and potentially look at things from more recovery stance rather than a building muscle. So I found, I found, for example, a really powerful tool for me was losing weight and um, it's it's had all kinds of great um, benefits. And education is another part to that too. But again, nice at your own pace. That's underexplored. That could do with some probably academic rigour or some thinking around how we do that better. I think get political for a moment, but I think we do it terribly. The whole transition piece from defence to the ESO community is 
terrible. And the ESO community is so fractured, the external service organisation, no names, but it's so fractured and so at cross purposes. We need to get everyone in a room and say, right, let's this this is the main strategic outcome we want to achieve. Let's all get in and find our spot rather than everybody trying to I'm not going to criticize any individual one, but the fact is there just are so many when our resources are so, you know, salami sliced between them all. Yeah. It can't be as effective as more cohesive approach. Yeah. No, it's not. It really is terrible at times when people are arguing. What I fear is you'll have two organisations, because it's all about numbers, how many veterans are you treating and helping and whatnot. You know, my biggest fear is we'll have two veteran organisations standing over a dead body fighting over who's going to look after his family or his or whatever, you know. So, And these are the unfortunate potential outcomes that we might have. You know, without, I won't labour on it, but I think that uh, transition happens way too late. We should be transitioning people from the day they join, in fact, because we know service for everybody, whether you, no matter what sphere you go into, into the military full stop, has a certain impact that's not always positive on an individual. And we know that now, so we should be treating it right from the start and having some kind of preventative uh, approaches, whereas at the moment it's very reactionary. And, and I know I speak to veterans all the time all the time, hundreds, travel regionally in Victoria to chat with people. Their perspective is, you know, where do you go? Who's the best? Who's best suited for me? And no one really knows. In Victoria, they're doing a good job. The RSL and Legacy have got together. And I think they are the right organisation to kind of lead this, it feels to me. So hopefully they can build a a community or an ecosystem rather than ecosystem kind of approach rather than a... um, this kind of fractured, fragmented work that goes on at the moment. I mean, there are so many of these micro ESOs that are doing fantastic work as well. I don't mean to belittle mm. or criticise any of the wonderful work they're doing. It's more, just more a big picture issue. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, Harry, what are you doing with yourself today and including your philanthropic efforts? My philanthropic efforts first is just to help regiment guys educate themselves while they're in service so that's uh of as i said the transition's too late so my approach or our approach it's a unit approach is to start that transition much much earlier than than the end of a career i work in developing the network in which that is and it's a vetted trusted network so again we have some sensitivities that we need to to maintain Personally, uh, look, it's been brilliant two years with my wife. We've become best mates again. We were a bit nervous whether we loved each other, <laughs> still loved each other when we came to Melbourne. And she can't send you away to Afghanistan because you're more disruptive at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, It's been wonderful, a wonderful time, blessed to have held on to her. That's been my main effort and probably the great revelation of the last couple of years very still very supportive you know she's left her family to come to melbourne here and we're hopefully going to buy a house here surely working on building my relationship with my son that's an equal priority as well so we're getting there slowly he's uh, i think been negatively impacted by my services no doubt about that so we uh, will continue to work on that but uh, i love him deeply and we'll, we'll keep him. my daughter just moved to sydney so we're all on the east side that's good Personally, I'll finish my master's hopefully this year. I'd like to break out and go into some kind of performance psychology consultancy. I'm not sure what that looks like yet, but I'm exploring a few different avenues. And I'd like to continue to support our guys and other veterans within reason, because I think I need to step back a little bit from that as well. I think long term, I'd like to, I'll stay connected with the unit. We have an ability to stay connected for as long as the unit will have you in training and, and mentoring and coaching our new team leaders coming through, notwithstanding recent kind of trials and tribulations the unit's going through, which we worked through years ago, the unit is probably in the best place it's been in the time that I've been there. I've been there since 1989. It's a great time to be in the unit, brand new barracks, a new raft of excellent young men and women coming through through the pipeline and we're busy as ever and so it's it's nice to be asked to remain contacted with the unit and hopefully i can i've uh, got a few more years left to me to to give with the new outlook and approach to life in the uniform and life after and just the general culture of the military today what advice do you have for anyone aspiring to join the australian defense force or the sas specifically i'd say in terms of the adf is if you have even a small aspiration or curiosity about the ADF that you should get along to a Defence Force recruiting office or make an inquiry. It couldn't be easier these days. There's no obligation and just to get an insight into where you sit in terms of suitability 
to join the ADF, the, the Australian Defence Force. Uh, that's the first thing I'd say. And I think people would be pleasantly surprised, maybe even blown away at the opportunities in the Defence Force these days. For example, there's a gap year. They offer a gap year now for students out of year 12, which I think is just a sensational program. I wish I had been around when I was, uh, when I was a younger guy. So the opportunities to join the, the ADF these days are, are huge. I'd turn around and do it all again tomorrow. It's a, a great career. In terms of the SAS, only a couple of things I'd say. Be patient. You probably have a much better chance of success if you're a little bit older, probably mid-20s, mid to late 20s, I would say, is, is kind of the middle of the bell curve of success. You can come in too young. That's my opinion and my observation. And make sure when you're training, train a number of domains of your life. You don't, don't just train in the gym or physically, but uh, look to develop yourself cognitively, mentally, socially. We forget about that. Have you know? I'm not going to go into it here, but you you know consider the social aspects of your life and what impacts will be there. And also, you know, end on I suppose kind of consider the philosophical motivations and, and impacts that what I've talked about here. I guess only really skim the surface, but have a think about what the impacts are in terms of your values and your beliefs and your, your attitudes. You know, I think it's something that's only just starting to be explored, but I think it's a really good conversation starting point to have. And if you've got a family, make sure you factor them in all your decisions. Try not to be too selfish about it. You know, ultimately, bite off more than you can chew and keep chewing. Harry, it's been quite an insightful conversation. Thanks for coming on Life on the Line. Thanks for having me, Alex. I recorded this conversation with Harry in 2018. He's now a registered psychologist. One topic we did not cover in this interview, but we will in a future episode, is that Harry is the singer-songwriter for The Externals, an Australian SAS original rock band. Look them up on Facebook and Spotify, and find out more about the band in the Unforgiving 60 podcast episode 16, Who Sings Wins. We're going to close out today's show with their song, edge of the world, so stick around to hear that in just a moment. If you're interested in more interviews with Special Forces veterans, we've recorded a lot of conversations with SAS, Second Commando Regiment, and Special Operations Engineer Regiment veterans. For any of those, listen to the following episodes. Number 10, Eddie Robertson. Number 18, Don Barnby Volume 1 and Volume 2. Number 28, Mark Wales. Number 31, Dr. Dan Pronk Volume 1 and Volume 2. Number 36, Mark Donaldson, VC. Number 39, Reese Dowden. Number 44, Mick Bainbridge. Number 47, Bram Connolly. Number 49, Nathan Bolton. Number 51, Mark Noble. Number 54, H, Volumes 1, 2, and 3. And number 60, Nick Caldwell. If you want even more recommendations, number 25, Paul DeGelder, is a former paratrooper and Navy clearance diver. Number 29, Todd Vale, is a veteran of the 1st Commando Regiment. And number 65, Adrian Talbot, is an Australian veteran of the British Royal Marine Commandos. We also have some great bonus episodes with a Special Forces focus. In Season 1, listen to Australia's Special Forces with Dr. Carl James. In Season 2, try the bonus episodes The Commando's Father with Doug Baird and Voodoo Medics with Mark Donaldson VC. Dr. Dan Pronk and Kristen Shorten. And in Season 3 this year, check out Lessons of a Combat Doctor with Dr. Dan Pronk and SAS Leadership with Ben Pronk and Tim Curtis. Tell your friends about this conversation, number 68, Harry Moffat on Life on the Line, and post about this podcast on your social media to help us spread the word. You can also jump onto Apple Podcasts and leave us a five-star rating and even leave a written review. We're on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast, on Twitter at LOTL Pod, and our website is www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions. Artwork by Big Cat Design, theme music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thanks for listening, and lest we forget. Smile as he motioned for a
is 17 And by 21 it sailed the seven seas But it never seemed that far Someone 